and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Blackfist Publishing, don't forget the umlaut, and, create, and creator of the upcoming Heroes of Cerulea, the one and only Lucas Falk. How are you doing today, man? Or tonight, in your uh, case. Yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. I've been at work all day, uh, even though it's Saturday, so it's a nice change of pace to, to do something else. And, and yeah, mm -hmm. hang out with you. Yep. So... It's a bit of a tradition for me to open with the humble beginnings. And with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Right, yeah. Uh, I, I think I, I started out mainly with computer, uh, like computer role-playing games, uh, mm -hmm. like Boulder Skate, things like that. And then I, I, I learned through that there's something called tabletop role-playing. And I always felt interested in that, but no one around me was playing it or even knew about it. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, I met a friend, and he had a, a role-playing book uh, for some reason. He never tried it. And I, was, and I was like, yeah, we should try it together. So we put together a group of friends, and we tried it out. I think I, I was the game master for that. It was a Swedish game called Drakar och Demoner, which was... Oh, good time. Like a, a, <laughs> Good timing on that, since that's getting um, that's getting translated thanks to Free League. Right. Yeah. There's a uh, like a reboot or, or remake of that mm -hmm. coming out now. Yeah, I'm going to be covering the quick start about of that um, next week. All right. Cool. Yeah. So so that was my like introduction, and and we, and we played one session, and I loved it, and everyone else hated it, uh, so we never played again. But but. Uh, some way or another, I found my way into a gaming group a while later, and, and I stuck in, in the tabletop role playing world ever since. Mm -hmm. Oh, and did were you somebody who were given the? Now this is probably answered by ju by just going with Dragon Bane, but. Were you someone who, over the years, jumped between between different ga between different games, or were you more of a one system lifer? I think starting out, we, we were really into like the Docker the Moon or Dragon Bait game, but then we started drifting more into like freeform gaming, but using that game sort of as a basis. But we didn't really use the rules; we just used it to create character, and then. Mm -hmm. And then I, we did that for a while, like really free from gaming. And we figured, yeah, we should go, go back to having some rules at least, because we could make things more exciting and, and sort of less predictable. So we mm -hmm. got, like our my regular gaming group, we had gotten to know each other a bit too well, where everything felt predictable. And then we were like, yeah, but we never really enjoyed the, the rules fully. So I started working on, on like developing a system that would suit us instead. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I did that for a while, got really, like uh, like most people do, did my own, own Heartbreaker <laughs> version of, of the game we played for too long. And then I started discovering other games. So I had like, like pretty recently, I, I had like a year where we were trying different games every week. Mm -hmm. So, 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 uh, like really experimenting with different styles of games and different rule sets, and yeah, so, so I think I did both of them for a while. I, I mm -hmm. stayed with one game for a really long time, and then I tried everything I could get my hands on. Yeah, and now I think I'm sort of back into like being a bit more comfortable. I, I like having a, a game that I can rely on, and then every now and then I just do something different, mm -hmm. sort of like a palette palette cleanser. Campaigns. Yeah. So, 
taking that taking that into account, um, what were the what were the chain of events that led that led you to creating um, Heroes of Cerulea? So I've always been a, a big fan of Zelda games for for pretty much as long as I can remember, and I I think I stumbled across a, a couple of fan made Zelda RPGs and all things being sort of subjective, I was like, that's not how I would have done Zelda. That's not really uh, vibing with my idea of what a Zelda tabletop role-playing game would be. So I started designing one just for fun, trying to capture like the what what I personally see as the essence of Zelda. With, like uh, the items, the puzzle solving, the dungeons, uh, and it ended up being uh, like a uh, a playable game that I thought was, was sort of fun, and I started leaning more and more into uh, like video game tropes and, and video game logic for the game to make it stand out from other dungeon crawling tabletop RPGs. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I thought, thought like, yeah, this is uh, this is a game uh, that that's doing something a little bit different than other games. So perhaps we should. Uh, share it with more people so we did a, a quick start like three pamphlets one with the rules one with game mastering tools and one with a ready made dungeon mm -hmm. we shared that and got a lot of uh, positive feedback on it and then we figured yeah we should probably make this into a <laughs> yeah. quote unquote real game mm -hmm. and uh, yeah so that's how we ended up doing a Kickstarter, and now we're trying to make a, a physical book with a bit more tools, a bit more dungeons for you to play, and uh, cooler art. I did the, the art for the pamphlet games myself, and now we got a, a brilliant illustrator for this one doing pixel art illustrations. Mm -hmm. Full game. Yeah. Now... One th now, one thing that I did, I did notice when I when I looked through when I looked through a lot of the sheet and a lot of the rule set is the is the is the fact that you're using caltrops as your as your um, core mechanic. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I feel bad for anybody who's who's looking for any lost dice after sessions because nothing's worse than stepping on a D four. Yeah, yeah, that was like I wanted to go in a really minimalistic direction uh, mm -hmm. with how I described the, the setting and uh, the rules and everything, and like I, I had a, a personal system that I've been working on for a while using D six uh, dice, and I thought, what if we go even more minimalistic, just use D four dice, and with uh, like all the Zelda references. Uh, D4 die has, has a triangular basis. I thought that sort of mm -hmm. reminded me of Zelda, so so that's why we picked the D4 for the system. And then, like when we started the Kickstarter, and when we funded it, and people started asking about stretch goals. Uh, a lot of folks were saying, "Yeah, you should make custom dice." We started thinking about it, and like you know, getting. Uh, like talking to to dive creators and things like that, and, and we felt like maybe we could do something more fun than just a, a custom D4. So, mm -hmm. so I think it's looking like we, we're going to unlock the stretch goal where we make custom dice, but they're going to be D8s with two sets of one to four. So, mm -hmm. so that's. Uh, it could be an option for those who are afraid to, to step on the die. D8 is not as harmful as a D4, yeah. but you can still use them to play this game. Now, when I was looking at monster design, when I was looking at monster design in the thing, um, that brought me to another question: Is this an instance where the only the only die rolling is being done by the players, a la Cipher? Yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, like like the general direction of it, uh, I think we got more inspirations from 
like Powered by the Apocalypse and, and Blaze in the Dark sort of games. But but yeah, all, all the roles are made by players, and the players' roles also determine like the outcome of the monster's action. So the game master sort of declares the action of the monster. The the player declares the action of their hero, and then you make a roll. And if it's a a good roll, then the hero succeeds and the monster fails. And if it's a bad roll, the monster succeeds and the hero fails. And somewhere in between, perhaps both uh, succeed in mm. dealing harm to each other or whatever. So so yeah, I think. I've grown to really enjoy like the, the flow of the game when you don't stop to make double rolls for everyone. Mm-hmm. You get uh, like this is a, a, a video game inspired tabletop role playing game, but a lot of times I feel like uh, tabletop role playing games can sort of end up feeling like uh, turn based uh, video games like Final Fantasy or something like that, mm-hmm. uh, where Oh, uh, like one of the combatants performs an action, and then like the opponent performs an action, and you sort of sometimes you you get the feeling that they're just standing opposite each other, taking turns, hitting each other. And I I grown to really enjoy like the flow of when the a single role determines the outcome of both uh, parties' actions. And you can move on, and, and I think it's sort of. It reminds me also of the Zelda games, like everything's happening in real time, and sometimes you, you go in uh, to strike a monster, and they do something unexpected, or you're too slow, and they hit you, and you hit them back mm-hmm. uh, simultaneously, and I think that yep. that sort of system works really well for capturing the, the general feel of, of the combat in Zelda. Mm-hmm. Now, with that in with that in with that in mind, given the given the use of D4s, I'm curious if anybody has brought up Caltrop Core to you during the during the during uh, the Kickstarter. Yeah, I I think as we were ramping up to to launch the Kickstarter, someone told me about Caltrop Core and. Uh, yeah, uh, some, someone said, yeah, this is, uh, like, I was doing an interview the other day, and uh, they said, yeah, I think it's the first game to use tools of D4s or something like that. And I, uh, and I had to uh, correct them and said, no, there's something called Caltrop Core. And I think uh, the systems are sort of similar uh, in a lot of ways, uh, but I haven't really tried the, out Caltrop Core. I've, I, I, I've, I've dipped into it and there are, the similarity begins and ends with using D4s. Okay. Um, there is a there is a lot of there is a there is a fair amount of crossover, both being lo-fi um, kind of games, but Caltrop wants to wants to have a setup that people can take in a bunch of <clears throat> different directions, a bit more a bit semi universalist, but that's as far as it goes and. That's and of course there's other low there's other lo-fi projects like um like twenty four hundred. Right, yeah, that's a, a really cool project. But as far as what was the first one to use D fours exclusively, I could I couldn't answer that because sometimes that gets into a chicken and egg situation. Yeah, yeah. And I mean like everything's a remix and, and everyone's uh, getting inspired by each other and, and stealing from each other. In a good way, mm-hmm. so so yeah, I, I have no idea, but uh, it, it's uh, I think the D four could use some more love. Uh, it's it's definitely the most love of all the die, like really. Uh, it has mm-hmm. few fans, and I think it's, it's time for a, a D four uh, re rebrand or, or like get a bit a bit more love at least. I could I could see that, especially since I think I think some of the D four issues is um is some is some people having PTSD from from HP roles playing as wizards. Oh yeah, yeah, makes sense. 
Hey, I leveled I mean, up. Time to roll for my next HP. You only get one. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, that's. I had the same experience, and and I think like with a, uh, any other die, it rolls a bit better. So so you, it doesn't feel as anticlimactic because you look at it while it rolls, and then you're surprised by the result. Mm -hmm. Like in D four, it's, it's sort of like, uh, yeah, it just falls flat, and then it lands, and, and it's not really exciting. But I think rolling a, a pool of D four is a bit more exciting, and, and especially like that, the special cost of D eight, get more fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the ne so next I'm next thing I'm curious about is in regard in re, since keeping on the topic of monster design um since it it's a little it's a little hard to see it's a little hard to see the details of of the um image you talk you talk about dynamic confrontations when it comes to bosses um how how do you how do you plan on work on working that out? Since a, a few yesterday, I was I was finishing my coverage of Emberwin, and it has a kind of unlocking system with its with its AI hexes to to um, expand a boss's actions as the encounter goes. I'm not asking I'm not asking if you've got something similar. I'm just curious how you plan on having a set of dynamism when it comes to bosses. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds really cool. I'm gonna have to check that out. But in our case, it's the like you have a, a random table for for particular actions of the boss that you roll at the start of every round, and, and like be an area of effect attack, or it could be like a, a location manipulation sort of action, like you you, you move. A, play your character in some way or, or you move the boss in some way and but yeah so, so you ran, sort of randomize their action at every turn and they have a, a table of special actions and then on top of that you have like this, every boss is its own puzzle in a lot of ways mm -hmm. yeah, like with the Zelda games you're trying to solve the puzzle while the boss is attacking you so, so every boss has a weakness uh, that you need to exploit in order to damage it. So, so it's a it's a matter of like, uh, dealing with being attacked by the boss while also trying to figure out the puzzle, to survive for long enough to solve the puzzle, and then start to be able to deal damage to the boss. So mm -hmm. I think uh, that, that, that's uh, when we're first. Like the first breath of the game, bosses just were like regular monsters, but they had a lot of more health points and did more damage, and it ended up feeling sort of anticlimactic and not really Zelda-like. So, so having different, like a list of different special actions for the boss along mm -hmm. the puzzle, I think that makes for really dynamic uh, boss battles, but still quite uh, minimalistic and. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to puzzles, puzzles are something that is is one of those is one of those things that people are hesitant to ta to tackle in R in RPGs in uh, TTRPGs, I should say. Um, what philosophy do you have when it comes to establishing pu establishing puzzles in? In Heroes of Cerulea, because since since we're using Zelda as a as a big inspiration, puzz, um, puzzles are inevitable both with dungeons and with bosses, as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that sort of just clicked is the whole video game logic aspect. Uh, I think in, in a regular role-playing game, you're uh, like you're sort of you're often simulating a real world, whereas in uh, Heroes of Cerulea, you're more simulating a video game world. So, like you got uh, 
uh, unifying keys, uh, they can open any locked door. But once you use a key, the key disappears. And that's not at all how keys work in real life. Mm -hmm. But it makes sense in a video game world. And so, so, so the video game logic sort of allows you to to limit the different options. Uh, there are not an infinite amount of ways to approach a puzzle. There's like the video game logic sort of guides you into different options. And, and I think that helps uh, eliminate a lot of uh, frustration. Like, there are only so many things you can try out with a puzzle uh, in a video game. Mm -hmm. But uh, in a role playing game, uh, if the game master has like the correct solution, I'm just waiting for everyone to figure out the answer. It could be really frustrating and slow in mm -hmm. ways. Yeah, I can. And, and also, uh, like uh, a strength of the role playing games is that you can sort of allow for creative ways to solve a puzzle or a problem. I think we've also wanted to capture. Uh, there's not just one correct answer to every puzzle. There are sort of at least a couple of ways to solve the same uh, puzzle. And I think, yeah, uh, playtesting the, the game, all these things have, uh, have led to a different experience because I really agree with uh, it's, it's also really frustrating to be confronted with a puzzle, a regular tabletop role in the game, I think. Mm -hmm. The small peculiar details of this game helps you uh, have a more fun puzzle solving experience. Mm -hmm. Now, when when it comes to when it comes to hero creation in in the um, in the preview that in the preview that you put out, it's it's a case of assi assigning assigning the three attributes. Getting getting the base amount of hearts, energy, and gems, and and a um, special item. Um, yeah. Is is that more or less the way that character creation is going to end up working in the full game, or are there some more advanced steps that you're putting into that you're putting into the full book? Um, in many ways, it's quite similar. There are. In the full game, you'll be able to choose between different kin, like different mm -hmm. playable races that have uh, uh, special abilities and sort of uh, penalties or, or disadvantages as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the the focus of the game is not to have uh, an endless array of different player options for the character. It has more to do with like, and also there's like no level up system or, or no XP or anything like that. So everything is about the, the items that you find. As soon as you find an item, you're sort of, it sort of acts like a new special ability for that character. So the build you're doing has more to do with the, the items you're carrying with you because mm -hmm. they help you solve problems in, in uh, different ways. Yeah. So, so yeah, the, the we, we, it, it's really tempting once you're like expanding from a couple of pamphlets to a, a book. And it's easy to think, yeah, you could add a lot, a lot more stuff, and you can make like, the rules more advanced. But we tried to keep everything as as lo-fi, as minimalistic as possible, mm -hmm. while also having some options that make yeah characters different other but it's centered on having different items I would say mm -hmm. and given the given that setup um, when it comes to would would it be fair would it be fair of me to say that um, both in both in early game and late game your attributes aren't going to change that much no, they're, they're pretty static in, in that sense. Um, 
you're you might find some items that give you bonuses to certain roles and you're gonna get yeah you're gonna increase uh, the amount of damage you can take through finding hard containers uh, and yeah there are some special items that might change things a bit but the character stats you're starting out with pretty much stay the same throughout the whole game and it's not it's not really a game for at least uh, I didn't have a game in mind that was made for two year long campaigns more, it's sort of more like a palette cleanser you play a short campaign with characters explore dungeons and then you're sort of done with that campaign and you can move on and do something else or create a new character and play through new dungeons mm -hmm. so yeah uh, it, it, it's quite static in that sense uh, but but yeah uh, again the focus is on finding new items which gives you they give you new opportunities and, and uh, different mm -hmm. methods of interacting with puzzles and, and problems. Yeah. Now, with that with that in mind, from what I've from what I've seen thus far, it's it sounds like it sounds like this is not necessarily a game that would that is going to operate on the on a gr on a grid combat approach. It's going to lean more into theater of the mind. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, yeah. <laughs> in a way, it's a mix because uh, I, I found that uh, having uh, a map, like if you explore a dungeon, you have the game master uh, place down sort of map tiles that you can see, uh, like general layout of the room, and perhaps even see hidden uh, stuff on the map. That helps out uh, facilitating a. Uh, uh, a solo-like gaming experience, but combat and action sequences, I felt that uh, theater of the mind is more appropriate because you can get more, uh, you can get more of a game flow and less of, of a tactical approach. So mm -hmm. You get more of the sense that everything's happening in real time. Uh, There's more flexibility. On the on the subject of G, on the subject of GM advice, um, it did it did say both in the Kickstarter and on your site that you are going to be putting advice on how on how to how GMs can make their own dungeons. Um, is a lot of that just it, within that? Do you do you have plans on putting in a um, some sort of some sort of table set up to allow to allow for a random dungeon creation? Yeah, we've been looking into that. There's sort of there's sort of like a, a tables or like there's sort of that system in place already uh, within the game, like a, a method for creating a dungeon and ways to randomize challenges and boss and the item you find inside. Uh, so and even the name and the themes of the dungeon. So there's there there is a, like a system for developing your own dungeons, mm -hmm. and we we've also looked into perhaps having a like a website or, or something that could like where you just click a button and, and there will be a dungeon generated for you. And we'll see how the Kickstarter goes. Yeah. It's possible to do that, but the, the book comes with. A bunch of tables and like a, a procedure for creating a dungeon. Yeah, because I had no, I had noticed that the the two examples of dungeons that I've seen one one from the Kickstarter page and one and one being one from the Quick Start, um, both operate with kind of a kind of a three by three grid approach. Yeah, I think yeah, th those two dungeons are are design uh, on, on sort of that limitation but mm -hmm. there are dungeons included in, in the in the book that uh, yeah that, that expand a bit more on that and they have like different levels and, and it's not we're not we're not sticking to the three by three approach but i felt it's a really good starting point 
to design a dungeon because you get nine rooms and you can sort of fill them up with uh, uh, different challenges and you can have uh, connecting paths in an interesting way. So I think if you're designing your first dungeon, three by three approach could be good, and then you can sort of start to get more creative with how you're designing the dungeons. So. <laughs> I, fig- I figure with that, it's only a matter of time before some before somebody decides to create a create their own ver- their own version of the water temple in this thing. I cer- I certainly yeah. hope they don't, <laughs> because why <laughs> the, the hell the, would you do that? Uh, so so the book sort of comes with a, a ready to play campaign of, of four dungeons, mm-hmm. and one of those is a wa- water dungeons uh, dungeon with different levels, but. Yeah, it's not the Ocarina of Time. <laughs> yeah, no, it's that. It's, I think, I think uh, like the the three dimensional approach designing dungeons. I think that it's going to be hard to translate to tabletop setting. Yeah, because because it has so much to do with like see uh, experiencing a room in three dimensions. Well, I think more, this is more suited to like the classic. Uh, First Zelda game and Link to the Past, Link's Awakening, uh, like those sorts of dungeons. I I could have been I could have been just as cru- I could have been even more cruel and bring up Death Mountain from Zelda Two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that, that's, uh, I I I re- love the Zelda games and I have never really gotten into Zelda Two. Oh, I on my list, painful things. Zelda, t- I think Zelda Two is a bit is a bit overhated, but there are th- but there are certain things in it that I will not defend. And Death Mountain is the is one of my poster boys for what I like to call hand breaking and what my what my co host calls guy damn it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Basically, where the solution, where the solution to an to an obstacle is far too obtuse for you to come across it naturally, you almost need to have a guide. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, that's frustrating. And just just go back and look at the layout for De- for Death Mountain in, Z- in Zelda Two, and you'd see and you'd see why this is why it's such a perfect example of that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll check it out. But uh, but yeah, I think I think uh, I, yeah, dun- the dungeon design, like a, a, I think a top view and some sort of grid system is probably the way to go. But we, one of the stretch goals uh, we introduced recently was a third-party license that will allow anyone to just create stuff for, for the game and distribute it on their own, and sell it if they like. And uh, it will come with like a set of uh, map assets uh, mm-hmm. that you could use to create your own maps. And I'd be really interested in if anyone finds like, a different approach to designing dungeons and including more three-dimensional items or, or perhaps like a horizontal dungeon in, in some kind of way. That would be really exciting to see what people come up with. Mm-hmm. And with that, with that, in, with that, in, with that in mind, um, what are you shooting? For, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the, for the book? I think it will be around eighty pages. Uh, yeah, and, and mm-hmm. it will be sort of a, a small book with like an A five. Almost like a half letter size, mm-hmm. and the yeah the the rules are very minimalistic, and it will include a, a campaign with four dungeons, so we'll be packed with stuff. But the page count, we'll be, yeah, we'll try to keep it as low as possible. And since you're putting in advice for creating one's own dungeons, would you be? Do you have plans on doing something similar as far as giving advice on creating items? Yeah, I think like there's a, a list of uh, items uh, in the book 
uh, a random table. But I think yeah, that could probably be a useful thing too. But and it's so like the items they are uh, so connected to to um, challenges. Like it, a good item should help you solve challenges. And I think in a lot of ways, if you start to design a dungeon and you pick a theme, and perhaps you have some sort of idea for a boss, then mm. then the, the the item will be a lot of times come naturally because you'll be thinking about yeah, uh, yeah this type of puzzle and with this type of boss it could be these kinds of puzzles could be interesting to solve using an item that sort of works like this and I think yeah mm -hmm. it's going to be a creative challenge to come up with good items I think some, some guidelines for that Yeah, and I can I can certainly get be, I can certainly get behind that, um, and of of course I can see the same th I can see the same thing with monsters, but but um there's a but there's already a bit of a guideline for monster creation as is. I think in, in a lot of times yeah, guidelines are are really good, but I think at least for me, to me I, I sort of, I can get bored with reading too many guidelines. And I think one thing I learned through uh, the games I've designed before this one uh, is that like, you can use examples rather than guidelines. And if you have a list of items and you look through the items, sort of get an idea like is this, all these examples help you think of what a good item is. Or, or That's why we're including so many dungeons in, in the core rule book because looking at the dungeons you get an idea oh this is how they solve creating dungeons this game mm -hmm. these are some examples and then you can look at the examples and think like yeah I could probably come up with something better than this or I could improve on this idea rather than just having uh, guidelines that I think practical examples oftentimes mm -hmm. help out more than general guidelines. Yeah. Uh, and I think like the, the old school renaissance uh, gaming community uh, really big on that, like giving practical examples rather than explaining how to do things. Like there's a, a mm -hmm. sort of a, a intuitive, uh, you can sort of figure out how to do things by looking at things that are already created rather than someone explaining to you uh, this is how I, how I go about creating stuff. Mm -hmm. different, different approaches to the same problem, how to give people tools to, to create stuff on their own. Yeah, I can, I can certainly get that. Oh. Now, what... Now... First off, I do want to offer my congrats for how well the Kickstarter is doing. It's current. You're asking for um, six point six k, give and and change give give or take, and it's currently at twenty one point three k at the time of this recording. Yeah, we've been really lucky with the people. Like, it's always this is a really niche game, and we're a small Swedish uh, publishing company, mm -hmm. and. With games like these, uh, it's always hard to get the word out, and we've gotten a lot of help from, from friendly podcast hosts and, and things like that who help us get the word out. And uh, a lot of people on social media have been uh, bringing the word as well. Mm -hmm. we, we have a lot of people to thank for uh, the Kickstarter going as well as it's going. Considering it's a niche game by really uh, small niche creators. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that in mind, what what would you say have been some of the takeaways that you that you had when it came to uh, when you did, when you were doing um, play testing for it? I think uh, in the beginning, I, I was sort of leaning more into the, the old school Dungeons & Dragons 
tropes with the uh, yeah like experience and leveling systems I was looking at like resting and random monster encounters and timekeeping and things like that so I, I figured there's some sort of interesting similarities between old Zelda games and old role-playing games you're exploring dungeons and mm-hmm. sort of the player skill to solving puzzles rather than just character skill and as i started play testing i i noticed yeah this doesn't really give off Zelda vibes anymore because you have uh, the leveling system and the experiences and I think they, they don't exist in the Zelda uh, style games the same way so I think I had to, uh, I had to really keep the, the the core concept and core ambition in mind. And I kept making it more and more minimalistic and simple and more and more Zelda like. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, that, uh, it helped. I probably wouldn't have figured that out just looking at the rules. I, I had to play this a lot and, and feel. What the game felt like, like mm-hmm. the experience, what, what kind of vibes you gave off while you were playing. That was really helpful, and I had a lot of really uh, friendly people helping me out playtesting the game at different stages. Mm-hmm. And for my, for for what it's worth, from my end, I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how Heroes of Cerulea develops, but. With all of that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to the show and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Yeah, my pleasure. It was really fun chatting with you. And I, like I said, I really appreciate people helping get the word out. And Yeah, thank you again for having me on. Mm-hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps uh, next time we'll do an even, even later recording here. <laughs> I could be a bust while doing it. Yeah. Uh, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!